So this is a session about climate risks, and I'm super excited to present to you a very heterogeneous panel uh, that is going to discuss these topics uh, today. The panel has, let me start uh, on this side, Harrison Hong from Colombia, uh, who has working, been working on climate finance, uh, and many of you know uh, his work on this topic. Uh, there's Francis Moore, who is teaching uh, in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at UC Davis, and who just spent a year at the Council of Economic Advisors uh, working on exactly climate issues. Um, for example, on incorporating uh, climate costs uh, and adoption policies uh, into macro forecasts. Uh, for the, the presidential budget. Uh, so that's one of the things that she's been working on. Uh, next to me is Luke Taylor uh, Dwarton, uh, again, working on climate finance topics. And uh, it's been uh, all, all these people, I'm pretty sure you know their work already. Uh, and then there's Diego Kensick, uh, who is in the economics department at Northwestern. He works on climate issues from a macroeconomic perspective. Uh, so I'm super excited to have uh, a panel that is going to come from very different angles to this topic. Uh, and so I, I suspect we'll have a lot of things to discuss, including questions from you. Uh, so we want this panel to be fairly interactive. In fact, if you want to move closer to us, we'd be happy uh, to see you closer, uh, because we hope this to be an interactive panel. Uh, and so let, we'll start with uh, some remarks, but we'll jump in immediately with questions and, uh, and reactions. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much uh, for joining us today here. And thanks so much to Monica for putting this uh, panel together. I'm very excited to be here today. I think it is really important that we get a better understanding of uh, climate risks. And certainly, we can all benefit a lot from an interdisciplinary perspective. What I'm going to try to do today is to bring in a macro perspective on climate change and the associated transition risks. So I don't have to motivate the topic much, especially in this setting. Climate change is really probably the most pressing challenge of our time. And maybe somewhat depressingly, addressing climate change is actually quite straightforward, at least in theory, right? Going back to Pigou, this is a clear externality, so how do we address it? We have to internalize the climate externality by putting a price on polluting. But unfortunately, it has proven to be very difficult to implement in practice. This is because there is no benevolent social planner. There are close to 200 national governments, uh, each of which have their own interests in mind. So this is a global coordination problem. It's a very difficult one also because there are pervasive distributional aspects involved. In particular, how should we share the burden of the climate transition among developed countries who are largely responsible for anthropogenic climate change and developing countries who are in part still in the stage of industrialization. So bottom line here is that we are still far from, global, from carbon pricing at the global level. Much more progress has been made at the national level with the growing number of jurisdictions having implemented such policies either in the form of carbon taxes or cap and trade systems. So, here you can see a map with all the countries that have adopted or are planning to adopt a carbon pricing regime. And in the other chart, you can actually see that the share of emissions covered by these carbon pricing systems has increased substantially over the last couple of decades. But still today, only about a quarter of global emissions are covered by these systems. And also, the the prices in these markets stay very substantial, and in some markets they're actually still very low. So we have a far way to go. And in this context, an important question is also how far can we actually get with these national carbon pricing policies if the ideal of a global carbon price is not achievable? And one way to shed light on this is to do some quantitative analysis based on integrated assessment models uh, in the spirit of Nordhaus. So this is from a nice paper in the GEA by Hustler, Crusell, and Olofsson. They basically study suboptimal carbon pricing policies based on a multi-region integrated assessment model. And one of the findings from their analysis is that regional carbon taxes actually do not go such a long way. In fact, if you look at the case where only the EU implements a carbon price, which is the red dotted line, 
This doesn't move the, climate tra the temperature trajectory much from the baseline case with no intervention at all. But what they also find is that a global carbon price is a very powerful tool, even if it's only implemented at a moderate tax rate and can limit actually the increase in global average temperatures a lot. They also do some welfare analysis and they find that uh, it is very costly to let certain regions off the hook. So for instance, if we leave out Africa and India, this implies large welfare costs for other regions. And if we let China off the hook, the costs are even larger and some uh, trajectories of, of global average temperatures are no, not even achievable any longer. Another way to shed light on this is actually to look at the data because now some of these carbon pricing regimes have been around for uh, 20, 30 years, so we can actually study empirically how these policies have affected emissions. And there is growing empirical evidence that carbon pricing is successful at reducing emissions, but it also comes at an economic cost, so usually there is a temporary dip in GDP and industrial production. And importantly, these costs also seem to be distributed unequally across society, with uh, poorer households having to lift a larger part of the burden of these policies. And that's maybe also why climate policies uh, are sometimes not as popular and have been quite difficult to implement. So one instance of this is France. Uh, with the Yellow West movement, which actually started as an opposition against higher gasoline taxes. And against this backdrop, green investments or subsidies are a popular alternative. And in fact, if you look at the Biden administration today, they really seem to have given up on carbon pricing policies and have really embraced the green investment approach, uh, for instance, with the US Inflation Reduction Act. And then as a response, the EU also had to follow step with the European Green Deal. So the question is, how do green subsidies compare to carbon prices? And if we have both tools available, what is the optimal policy mix? There is a very nice paper in the AER by Achemoglu and co-authors that study this in an integrated assessment model with endogenous and directed technical change. And in their framework, what turns out to be crucial is the substitutability between dirty and clean inputs. And in the empirically plausible case when inputs are at least somewhat substitutable, it turns out that sustainable growth can be achieved with temporary taxes and subsidies. Importantly, the optimal policy involves both carbon taxes and innovation subsidies, as these subsidies help avoid the excessive use of carbon taxes, which can be associated with large costs during the transition. But what should we do if governments fail to meet the climate challenge? Can finance also help address and mitigate climate change? I think this is a very relevant question because in recent years we have really seen a boom in sustainable investing. And interestingly, we actually don't know that much how effective sustainable investing is at mitigating climate change. There is a nice recent working paper by Lasse Pedersen who studies this in a climate economy model Basically, the idea there is that the price of polluting can be affected directly via the carbon tax, but also indirectly by increasing the cost of capital of polluting firms. But what he shows is if the carbon tax is at the optimal level, there is in fact no role for green finance. Why is that? Essentially, there are too many cooks at work. If, if carbon taxes are at the efficient level, having uh, green finance in addition to that introduces additional unnecessary distortions. But Maybe in the more relevant case, as we are today, when carbon taxes are at the too low level, green finance can help. And in the limiting case, under some conditions, can even implement the social optimum. There are some assumptions that go into this. In particular, we have to be able to control the cost of capital quite flexibly. In particular, this has to be able to be set based on firm characteristics, but also firm's actions which is not that easy because for this we really need a lot of information on what firms actually do. And even if these assumptions are satisfied, the required increases in the cost of capital are relatively large and possibly they're larger than the estimated green finance effects that we know from the literature. But obviously green finance can help accelerate the climate transition, but here I just want to say it is likely no perfect substitute for carbon pricing. The climate transition also poses significant financial risks. Um, 
fact, if you look at earnings, conference calls, transition risks even seem to be somewhat more salient than physical risks associated with climate change. And this also shows up at the macro level. So here I plug a paper that I'm going to present tomorrow in a session on the macroeconomic implications of climate change, where we construct a new space index of climate policy uncertainty. And we show that an increase in climate policy uncertainty is associated with substantial macro costs. And this really illustrates the importance to design and communicate climate policy in a credible, transparent, and predictable way. But even if we don't manage to do that, doing something is still better than doing nothing because inaction is definitely way more costly. So this is it from my side. Um, really looking forward to the discussion. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Diego, for these uh, great uh, starting remarks. The, uh, one of the problems you highlight is the international dimension of uh, trying to involve other countries to do the right thing. And for that, I feel we need a lot more ideas uh, on how to do this, because otherwise we'll have a lot of political uncertainty right there as, as to whether countries like China are going to um, do the right thing or not do the right thing. And so I'm, I'm wondering uh, how others feel about these, these questions. I mean, um, so the, the question is about the, like, other countries, kind yes. of. I mean, I think if you look at, you know, the international agenda, you know, the, the, the framework for this is the Paris Agreement, which, I mean, it, it's, it's essentially works, it's designed as an agreement where there is a, a, a high-level goal. The high-level goal is a two-degree stabilization with consideration of one, 1. 1.5 degrees. And then there's a set of like bottom-up commitments coming from countries. There's no guarantee that those two things equal. And for a long time, it was the case that the what c countries were committing to did not add up to the top-line goal. But actually, that has really changed. It really changed um, about in around 2021. We saw a lot of additional commitments from countries that really now is, you know, if, if they follow through, and that's a big question, but if they follow through on the commitments they've made under the Paris Agreement, then that's going to be sufficient to get to two degrees if, if we're kind of lucky with some uncertainties in the climate system. Um, so I, I do think the trajectory is in the right direction, for sure. And actually, if you look at the, um, the distribution over temperatures in 2100, like we've really, you know, the evolving climate policy has really shaved off at least a degree, if not more, of likely temperatures in 2100. Um, and that's, you know, that's something that's changed in the last 10 years. <laughs> Maybe I can add one thing here. Um, one policy that can also be successful at incentivizing other countries to join uh, carbon pricing initiatives is the carbon border adjustment mechanism that, for instance, the EU has proposed and is now in its transitional phase. So actually firms now have to report how much they import uh, in these sectors that are prone to carbon leakage. Um, and if done right, this can re be really powerful, obviously, because then this creates an incentive for other countries also to establish carbon pricing initiatives. The problem is just that there are important distributional aspects involved here too. In particular, if, if you impose it equally on all countries, including developing countries, that may be perceived as a bit unfair. And in fact, in currently how it's implemented, there is no way how um, maybe countries in Africa are treated differently from, from the US, and I think that's a problem. We have to uh, take this seriously. And one thing that I also want to mention is maybe a bit more of a positive note, because countries always think about the costs of these policies. But in fact, climate change also creates huge opportunities, right? If you emerge as a leader in green technologies, because the climate transition it will be in inevitable, so you will be in a good position uh, if you are a leader. And, for instance, China has proven to be a leader in the production of solar cells and electric vehicles. So I think that's something that uh, the West definitely has, has to think about. Yeah, uh, probably a lot is going to depend on the next election in the United States, obviously. I mean, if, if Biden gets reelected, and 
the Inflation Reduction Act um, is a pretty major piece of legislation that I think has huge spillovers globally, really, in terms of um, the amount of subsidies uh, that, that's going to kind of affect the entire global supply chain. Um, so I think kind of unless the United, until the United States can kind of raise, you know, in one form or another, uh, its, 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 its investments in sort of um, the transition, you know, I think it's very hard to ask the rest of the world to, to do stuff, basically, yeah. It, I, it'll be really interesting to see what happens in the EU with the, the, the border carbon uh, adjustment. Uh, but, but I agree completely with what Harrison said. It's going to be tough for the United States to ask other countries to, to, to take action. Uh, I, I think it's shocking that if you look at developed, developed economies, the only two developed economies without na national carbon pricing are the United States and Australia. Um, so it would be tough for, and at the same time, we've seen several times in U.S. Congress, there has been legislation at least attempted on a border carbon adjustment, mostly introduced by Democrats. It's never gone through, but again, it's hard to see how we can credibly put in a border carbon adjustment when we ourselves in the United States don't have national carbon pricing. One other, other point on the international coordination part, I mean, the idea of a border, border carbon adjustment goes back to a, uh, an idea that the great climate economist William Nordhaus put out uh, roughly 10 years ago. He proposed uh, this idea of, of, of uh, climate clubs. So a, a climate club is a, a group of countries that agree to harmonized emissions reductions. For example, countries within the club might have a harmonized carbon tax. Um, countries outside of the club are penalized when they try to import into the club, uh, not necessarily with a carbon border adjustment uh, tariff, but maybe with just a, a broad general tariff, and that penalty would incentivize other countries to join the club. So it would actually work a lot like a, a carbon border adjustment. Maybe I can add one thing. Yes. I touched upon it a bit already. Uh, in my introductory remarks on the comparison of carbon prices and, and green investment. So I think it's not clear like which one is more effective. And one thing that I find crucial is green subsidies, at least during the transition, could actually even lead to a decrease in energy prices if like renewables become more competitive. And obviously this has also impacts on the behavior of households and firms. So that's why I strongly believe that having a carbon price in place in addition maybe to other policies to complement it is crucial and that's also why I share kind of the frustration that there is so little progress in the US at least at the national level but it's reassuring that at least in some states or regions there are actually initiatives for instance in California or in the Northeast so that's definitely something to build on. I want to comment also on the, you showed the, uh, the optimal carbon pricing uh, path. And the, one of the questions I have is in these mo models, there's a lot of uncertainty about how to put in numbers and actually get uh, quantitative implications for carbon pricing. And I'm, I'm wondering how, how people here on the panel think about those numbers and how, how certain we are about uh, thinking about carbon pricing. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent uh, question. And I think, I mean, the uncertainty is really crucial. Um, we know that like a lot of the climate change is anthropogenic and that there can be substantial warming, but we know very little how much warming there will actually be and also how this will translate into damages. So if you look at the estimates of social cost of carbon, the range is actually humongous. So in these models, I mean, there are a number of factors that are really important. The discount rate, this goes back to the debate uh, between Nordhaus and Stern. Uh, also, basically, the, the expected, the projected damages are crucial. And obviously, what we have to do is a lot of sensitivity analysis. Uh, but given this uncertainty, one thing that is also important is that we have robust policies in place that leave little room for regret because, I mean, there is a lot of downside risks. And that's why I think it's way less costly to be, like, more stringent than being too lax. I'll just put in a plug for tomorrow morning. There is a session that I am co-organizing on uh, um, methodologies for um, calculating the social cost of carbon, which is kind of equivalent to an optimal carbon tax. Um, 
Otherwise, we'll move on to Harrison's remarks. All right, thanks. Thanks, Monica, for uh, organizing this panel. So uh, let me just make, um, I have like a few slides and I was kind of share it to, and, and I think, you know, my, my slides follow up with what uh, Diego just talked about. So I'm gonna focus, you know, on the cost of climate change to capital. So I'm kind of reframing uh, this, these, these comments about risk uh, in, in kind of a more bl uh, blasé way. So let, let me start with this, um, this picture here. So this is, you know, your typical flow chart for uh, an integrated assessment model. Okay, so capital uh, at the top is at the center, right? So, so capital uh, leads to output. Okay, but as a byproduct of this production, capital leads to these carbon emissions, which, you know, according to scientists, can sort of do bad things to the atmosphere, creating potentially sort of these, 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 these climate tipping points that, you know, kind of the, the worst of it, of course, is that we get these kind of extreme weather disasters, which, of course, in turn then destroys capital. Uh, so that's what I would call kind of, you know, I think is typically referred to as the physical risk or the direct cost of uh, global warming, okay, on, on society. But here, this is narrated through, through kind of a destruction of capital. And the destruction of this capital, whether you think it's just sort of like islands in the Pacific being inundated with water and then nobody can live in Fiji anymore, right, it's just kind of an example of that. Now, of course, um, you know, faced with this, these, these, these climate risk threats, um, society, of course, is going to do some, some, some response. So what are the responses? So you know, we're going to have to divert some of the output that would have gone to investment and would have gone to consumption into right, some combination of abatement or adaptation, right? And so this, this combo of abatement and adaptation, of course, is costly, right? And, and, and these are, you know, not things we would have other would like to do. I mean, we would have liked to build nicer homes or, i.e., you know, eat more delicious stuff. Uh, but, but as a result, you know, we have to do some diversion of these, these precious resources. And, and this abatement and adaptation, I'll just say, is going to lead to some notion of a mitigation capital, right? So this could be seawalls, this could be a bunch of plants sucking CO2, you know, whatever. It could also be, you know, preserving, you know, uh, nicer sets of forests to capture CO2. And, and this mitigation capital is going to then serve two functions. It either is going to remove some, some CO2 and hopefully stabilize the atmosphere so that, you know, I think we have already tipped, we've already had some tipping points, but maybe not tipped too much. Uh, alternatively, you know, the seawalls can just, we'll let the climate tip and then we'll just protect ourselves by living in like, you know, uh, houses that are elevated very high. Okay, so it's going to be some combination of these two things. But, you know, kind of the point is that whatever types of things that we're thinking of doing for society, we ultimately need estimates of these costs, which is really the hard part, right? It's very, very difficult to get estimates of these costs. And so, you know, despite, of course, all the sa fancy sounding notions of integrated assessment models, it's kind of, you know, everything relies on these, 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 these estimates, which, you know, having worked with these types of models is, you know, it's quite difficult. Um, but I am gonna give you some conjectures. I mean, I, I would not call this like publishable, but I'll, I'll give you, because I think Monica wanted more excitement on the panel, uh, I'll, I'll give you some, some conjectures. Okay, so let me kind of start with, in my mind, what are like the stylized facts, to, you know, and there's many stylized facts, but these are the same ones for me. So on the left panel is a picture that's a survey that the IPCC uh, recently put out on what is it the climate scientists who are the best ones available to work on, in this particular case, tropical cyclones. Right. If you take the 50 best models at the, you know, that are currently being run, and you ask them, what will the frequency of categories four and five hurricanes be like in a two degree C world? This is a box plot of the 50 models at different what's called basins. So, so you know, one of them is globally, and then there's basically various basins like you know, uh, North Atlantic, et cetera. So just look at the plot. So basically it just says we don't know anything, essentially, right? Uh, you know, this is a massive dispersion in, 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 in the box plot. You know, so like the, the worst models are like pretty bad. You know, like as in we're getting hit all the time. 
Uh, so I, I think that's kind of the first fact about, quote unquote, what I would call kind of what we think we know about the physical risk, which is, you know, not very much, I guess. Uh, that is, we have a really, really thick tail, I suppose, uh, that we're only going to learn about maybe over the next century. Now, that's the bad news. Okay. I think there's, the, there's a lot of bad news. Uh, so on the good news side, right, which is, you know, less discernible, which is this is the price of installing, uh, this is per kilowatt, uh, this is from the uh, US EIA. The price of installing, uh, of generating one kilowatt of electricity using three different methods. So, so the black line uh, at the bottom is fossil fuel. So it's always been around like $1,000 per kilowatt. Now, if you were to tell me, standing in 2012, right, solar and wind, the cost was crazy. I mean, especially basically, I think, for, um, for solar. It was like, you know, magnitudes you know, like three, four times more expensive. But, you know, I think kind of a very piece of good news is that over the last 15 years, these costs have come down a lot, actually. So I think kind of the one piece of good news is that, you know, we're almost at parity on a lot of these uh, uh, sources of energy. You know, there's still a latent intermittency problem that you have with renewables that's it's challenging, so that batteries and storage is also important. But you know, we're like fighting a very different ball game from like, you know, if we were standing here in 2012 and I showed you these two plots, you'd be like, we're doomed, right? But you know, mixed news, I suppose, right? In terms of of of, of kind of the cost. So then I'll show you two other plots to kind of talk about then the damages, and then I'll give you my judgment. Kind of what I want to do is I'm going to give you a kind of a judgment of what's going to be more important these physical risk or quote unquote these transition risk. And I think in my general view is that these baked in tipping point climate risk are probably a physical risk or a much bigger deal. We just haven't felt it yet. We're beginning to feel it. Because think about what's going to happen, right? You know, we're in the most optimistic scenario we're ever, we're going to basically keep ourselves within two degrees C. And in a two degrees C world, that's the kind of plot that you have, right? Which is, there's this huge uh, dispersion in terms of what's going to happen with, with these sort of disasters. That's a little bit already baked in. Even under a very optimistic scenario now where we have renewable costs that are kind of almost at parity with, with fossil fuels. So what happens when a hurricane strikes? Um, so this is some panel estimates of costs from disasters. So, so this is like a panel. It's 100 countries. So the panel runs anywhere from like the last 30 to 40 years. Um, and, and, you know, kind of the, the, the basic punchline, having run a bunch of these regressions, is the, is the following. A typical cyclone, and now remember, the typical country here is not the U.S. The typical country is like the Philippines, okay? So, so this is like the vast majority of the world. This is not just us. But in a typical country, you know, when you get, an, when you get a, a, a typical cyclone, it's pretty bad. Like, you know, it's actually, you know, we just don't hear about it because, you know, in, in some, to some extent, we're beginning to see it more now with Florida and all of this other stuff. It's pretty bad, right? So, like, these countries are growing only at 2%, but they lose something like close to, like, 80 basis points of growth that persists for probably two to three, four years. Investment just craters. Right. There's like literally like no investment. And this is true, actually, whether you do cyclones or extreme temperature. So what I mean by extreme temperature here is like a very, very hot summer where you get like a bunch of like heat waves. Nothing happens to consumption for now. Uh, Tobin's Q drops a bit, like 20%, but you know, not, not, not amazing. But remember, this is in sample for one typical strike in a period where the risk, the physical risk aren't really all that high yet. Right, because we're not in this two degree C world yet where you're going to be getting frequent. Remember, a typical country here is getting hit once every seven years by these disasters. Now, if you go forward and you basically have countries getting hit once every two years or once every year, then the last two figures show you that what happens is when, when a hurricane strikes, the probability of a future strike is elevated. So what does that tell me? That tells me a little bit that we're in kind of a learning world, right? That, you know, Mother Nature is sending us, like there's a latent state that's like a bad state that these climate models are telling us. And we're getting draws from Mother Nature. And we're kind of learning over time, really, 
where we're going to be on the risk distribution. So then the final panel is that if you elevate these risks with every strike, so something like a 4% increase in risk, so if you go up four, four percentage points in risk, is associated with the Tobin's Q drop of about 0.2, which is not that big of a deal, of course, as long as we're staying within this ballpark. But if you're talking about now, like, let's say we realize, you know, in 50 years that, oh, it's pretty bad. You know, we're at like, you know, a, 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 a risk of like expected where we're getting hit once every two years. Now you're going to multiply that on, on the Tobin's Q. Now, of course, this is very like, this wouldn't get published, but this is my eyeball econometrics and my general sense of how one might put a sense around these risks. Final slide, and then I'm going to stop. So what do I think, why do I think physical risk is going to be bigger than, than the transition risk, at least from the perspective of capital, right? So if I'm a capital owner, am I really worried about climate policy? So my answer is going to be no. Okay, and I'm going to tell you why. Because everybody else is going to pay for it, not the capital owners. Right, so this is a study, this is like a working paper. Uh, it's a new working paper that I have with Jeff Kubig and, and Edward Shore. So this looks at the effect of these renewable portfolio standards in the United States on investor-owned utilities, okay? So what's nice about these, this RPS setup is that I think as, 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 as Luke and Diego mentioned, you know, the United States has no national carbon tax, but the climate policy in blue states with regard to investor-owned utilities is incredibly aggressive. So blue states have a lot of wind farms and solar farms for electricity generation. And, and these policies really started right around the mid-2000s. And what these charts show you is the following. When these blue states, and, and what's nice about kind of a causal treatment is that they exempted the municipal producers, right? Because the general view was the municipal producers are the nice guys. You know, they're, you know somehow their emissions doesn't count. Only the, the capitalist investor-owned guys uh, count. So, so that's nice. So there's like a kind of a very ideological type of a, a natural experiment. So, so a typical RPS is something like 2.5% of, of, of capital. And so what you, what, what you see is that when the RPS gets implemented relative to the municipals who are exempted, you see what you would expect. Investments in green go up. To pay for this, these investor-owned companies have to go and issue debt. When they go issue debt, it's longer-term maturity. And then, and actually what's interesting is in the early years, their yield spreads spiked a lot. So public uh, bond investors were saying to themselves, wait a minute, you're going to ask me to fund all these wind farms and solar farms? Hang on a second. You know, let me charge you kind of this, this higher credit spread. But here's what's remarkable. It's pretty short-lived. It reverts. Later on, the credit ratings of these companies actually improve, even though apparently they were hit with this massive climate policy that, that is essentially transformed the electricity power generation in the United States, in blue states. I think over 50% of it is generated by renewable sources now. So how could this have happened? Well, I think kind of there's two things. First, it was the first chart I showed you, which is the prices of renewables fell a lot, right? It was not nearly as bad. So if the prices had not fallen, these companies, right, would have basically been hit massively. And the second, of course, is eventually the regulators passed on the higher costs of renewables to consumers. Right? And that's the last part. So, so that a combination of cost pass-through and falling renewable prices, I think, largely mitigated the, these effects from, 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 from the point of view of capital owners. But of course, you know, that doesn't address, I think, kind of this physical risk right, that are not manifested today Right, because we're, that's, that's exactly the long-run risk. Right? We're basically waiting to see what's going to happen in, in, in 50 to 100 years. Right, I'll stop there. Harrison, I'm wondering if I could ask you a question about your, your box plot showing that different models can give you wildly different forecasts. So I see that, and I, th and I think you know, there's a lot of model uncertainty. And it's something that, that gets talked about a lot, uh, in particular critics of policy action on climate point to that as an excuse for doing nothing. But my question for you is, if there's more model uncertain, if there's more model uncertainty, should that make us more willing to act on climate policy or less willing to act on climate policy? Yeah, that's Luke, that's Luke that, that was a great question. So it depends on how you model the 
it depends on the model, of course, right? Because if you think there's some, you know, uh, if you think some types of acting investment relies on, there's like an option, there's like an option to wait element. But I think generally, and this is the paper I have with Nung uh, and, and Jin Chang and Econometrica. So we actually do work out exactly the question you say, which is what happens in an integrated assessment model with a huge amount of model uncertainty about these physical risks, okay, where the government or society also has some options to build in some adaptation. And, and there, what you find is that the model uncertainty generates much more acting. You would actually want to start adapting now exactly because you face a huge amount of this, this risk. So I, I think that it really depends on the people who kind of argue for this delay, I think is not a very robust argument, right? I, I think that if you write down a typical generic model, unless you build in a huge amount of irreversibility, right, there would always basically be, you're always prepping climate policy in the face of this long run risk, which the model uncertainty is just gonna amplify it, right? Because the, the learning element is just gonna amplify all of this, and you're gonna wanna have some precautionary uh, real hedging uh, that you would actually want to continuously update, right? So depending on realizations of where you are in terms of what you're observing about which of these models turn out to be right, right, you would have kind of an optimal dynamic policy that, 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 that tracks that. And I think kind of from my perspective, we should be doing more acting because I think 2023, if you look at the arrival of physical risk, it's just been astonishing. I mean, I think basically it's been like a blockbuster year. I think Mother Nature is telling us the, the worst case models are more likely to be right than the, the, the benign model. So. I, I can speak to that a little bit too, and I'm gonna um, talk more about this in my, my uh, remarks as well that I think are gonna follow nicely from what Harrison is talking about. Um, but if you think about what is a for a given location on the planet? What is a what is you know the best information you have about your weather risk? Historically, that has always been like what is the weather like history at that location? And what climate change does is it says well that's you know we kind of have ambiguity now over the relevance of that historic data for the risks we face today. And that, so that is inherently kind of risk you know increasing the risk. It almost doesn't matter what. Um, the climate models say, right, all you, what you're doing is you're saying this information that w really is what we've been using to manage weather risk, to, ma to manage climate risk over, you know, centuries is potentially no longer relevant. And we, 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 don't, we don't really have good bounds on how relevant or not that is. And I think, you know, that there is like uncertainty that comes from that and that uncertainty is costly. Maybe I can add one thing about uh, the comparison of transition and physical risks. So, so I completely agree. I mean, maybe transition risks are more relevant in the short to medium term, but in the long term, definitely the physical risks are more important. Because one thing that we also know from climate science is that increasing global average temperatures also lead to the more frequent occurrence of extreme weather events like cyclones, storms, etc. Uh, so, I mean, even from your event study estimates, if you basically combine this with this increased frequency, I think you can get pretty large numbers already. And also, just this year, um, like, there is a very severe El Nino uh, event going on. So, I mean, it's definitely a lot of things to be concerned about and taken seriously. And then maybe one question, because you mentioned one, one interesting uh, point, like in... In the, in the blue states where capital owners, despite these quite aggressive uh, policies on renewable, uh, renewables, they were able basically to pass on a lot of these costs. Uh, but obviously at the end, consum consumers uh, basically then have to burden this. So I was wondering, like, has there been some opposition already or is it because it's so indirect, they don't really realize what's going on? I, I think this, um, the, the, the estimates on this renewable power dovetails a lot very well with, I think, Diego's work on basically this is kind of the, you know, we're seeing in the blue states exactly kind of what you're seeing with this, um, with the European experience where, you know, it doesn't seem as if, right, uh, um, 
at least kind of in the blue states, you know, the, the consumers seem to be okay with tolerating uh, these, these higher electricity prices. And they have gone up quite a bit, actually. Now, you know, so I, I, don't, I don't quite know. And, and yet it's the red state people are unhappy. So I don't, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't quite know exactly what's going on, but. Let's uh, move on to Francis. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks to Monica for, for organizing this session. And this is, I think it's good going right after Harrison because I'm going to, um, I think, speak to um, particularly this uncertainty in the physical climate risks. Um, I thought before jumping into the slides, I might start um, drawing on some of the lessons uh, and, and just kind of communicating back some of the the policy setting for some of this work um, coming out of CEA. Um, so for those of you that are not aware, there is a lot of work in the federal government on climate risk right now is being organized under um, this executive order on climate-related financial risk, uh, which came uh, out in, I think, um, early 2021. Um, and it's really a kind of all-encompassing executive order that directs lot, you know, many, many agencies, the, the economic agencies, um, financial oversight uh, agencies to really start trying to quantify and manage um, and assess climate-related risks. And so this, is, this has led to a wide array of work streams across the federal government that includes kind of work under FHFA the, on, on, on mortgage risk, pension and life savings. And then some of the work I was involved in at CEA uh, was working with uh, the Office of Management and Budget to try and quantify risk to the federal budget. Um, that includes both in the macroeconomic forecast um, and so kind of general growth and tax revenues as well as um, kind of specific um, f um, um, fiscal costs that come through federal spending requirements um, that might be affected by climate change. Um, in, in addition, there's a, a, like parallel work going on through the, the Fed. They have a pilot exercise on climate-related uh, risks. Um, and internationally, kind of a lot of the, the other central banks are kind of moving in this direction as well, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, where they're looking at, again, at financial stability exercises around climate change as well as disclosure requirements. So that's the kind of, I would say, like the like high-level, big-picture setting here. <clears throat> what I'd like to do here is kind of... Um, dive in a bit to the physical risk side, which is where a lot of my work sits. Um, what I'm, I, I kind of thought it would be nice, like right before the holidays in mid-December, there was the American Geophysical Union Conference. This is an active topic of conversation there as well, this question of what does climate risk look like? How does it interact with society, with you know, the things we care about? And they are kind of including kind of financial institutions, so there were kind of insurers there. Um, and I thought I'd kind of bring some of the, the lessons, some of my takeaways from there um, to this as well. Um, so the first point is climate models, you know, we, we talk a lot about climate models, what they can and can't do, uh, their uncertainty. They're really good at what they were designed to do. And what they were designed to do is really to model the average global temperature response to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and to kind of say, if we start putting um, you know, radiatively active gases in the atmosphere, what is going to ha happen to the Earth's energy budget? Um, and how to then inform things like what would a two degree stabilization target look like? What would need to happen to emissions? Um, and so this is just the, the range of the climate models uh, kind of shown in gray here, and then the kind of surface temperature trajectory um, under multiple different measures kind of shown in the wiggles here with the average, uh, the average, you know, basically that, those observations are kind of sitting right on top of that, that multi-model average um, going back to, to 1970. So, you know, Climate models are really good at what they were designed to do. But a lot of the financial risk applications that we're now thinking about in terms of disclosure or um, adaptation planning um, are really, really different. Like, we, we are asking very different things of these models. So climate, the things these climate models are really good at is large spatial scales, where here we're talking kind of continental averages or even global averages, 
um, looking at very long time scales, so that means kind of 50 to 100 years, looking at average climate conditions, so kind of things like mean temperature, um, and looking at like these physical climate variables, so, so temperature, maybe rainfall, things like that. In contrast, these like financial risk applications, typically they are asking for asset level information, right? So incredibly, incredibly spatially, uh, high spatial resolution is often on either kind of today or kind of near term, what I would call near term timescales, which is I, I would call less than 30 years. Um, there's a real focus on extreme events. You've heard hurricanes come up multiple times, um, and that's because that is what drives a lot of the damages. That is where the risk comes from. Um, it's very different than the, the kind of climatology of those and the, the, the science behind them. What's driving the changes is very different, maybe, potentially from what's driving changes in the mean. And then there's a focus on not just you know, just the climate change variables themselves, but actually the losses. And that requires then going beyond kind of what these um, global climate model, the general circulation models are gonna spit out. Um, and so we shouldn't be surprised then that if we start asking these models to kind of serve this very different purpose, we are getting kind of large error bounds. They are kind of maybe disagreeing with each other. And in particular, I think with, kind of speaking from the kind of scientist side and kind of channeling a bit of what I heard at AGU is that they are quite nervous, I think, about the use of like some of this output um, in these kind of very different applications. And there is, in fact, a lot of science that needs to be done to kind of flush this out properly. Um, just to give you a sense of just how quickly the science is evolving, um, I kind of pulled out, this is just two papers from just this year from kind of these are, these are like well-respected uh, kind of climate science names um, and institutions here. <clears throat> One is about wildfire risk. So um, this is just from the abstract of this and I'll read it out. So, over the arid and semi-arid regions of the world, predominant signal in all model simulations is an increase in atmospheric water vapor. So there is more water in the atmosphere. In observations, this increase in atmospheric water vapor has not happened. It indicates a major gap in our understanding and modeling capabilities, which could have severe implications for hydroclimatic projections, including fire hazard moving forward. So this is essentially saying the models are all projecting one thing that kind of contradicts what the observations are. Um, in this one particular variable that is highly relevant for uh, wildfire risk. Um, and that, you know, there's this problem of kind of potentially systemic risk uh, if we're relying exclusively on these climate models as they currently stand. Um, a very similar um, paper, this, is, this one on tropical cyclones, um, kind of pointing out, uh, this is related to trends in the El Nino, La Nina cycle and saying the models are incorrectly simulating the equatorial Pacific response to greenhouse gas warming, where the equatorial Pacific is particularly important here because of its role in El Nino. This implies that projections of regional tropical cyclone activity may be incorrect as well, perhaps even in the direction of change. Other perils, including severe convective storms and droughts, will be projected erroneously. Um, and so, once again, this is kind of pointing out that the trends and observations are kind of seem to be very different from the models, and the kind, you know, the science we need to really evaluate the model for this kind of applications is, is really missing, I would say, from the kind of public science. Nevertheless, because of the regulatory um, and kind of private sector demand for this climate risk information, what you are seeing is a growing number of companies that are kind of springing up to provide an answer. And I would describe this kind of, you know, watching this evolve. Um, I think there is like a growing lemons problem uh, in this space where a lemons problem here is characterized by uh, really asymmetric information um, uh, where the, the, the buyer is not able to, to evaluate quality and you kind of get this race to the bottom in the, the price you're able to, to sustain in the market. Um, the number of firms marketing the physical climate risk information is really growing rapidly. Um, and distinguishing quality is really challenging in the space, right? Like with weather forecasts, we have this falsifiability of forecasts, right? If, if, if your forecast is wrong, you know, you kind of know that the next day. These are forecasts over kind of 20 years um, and they are forecasts of statistical properties, right? So it may, 
you know, the falsifiability of these is really hard. We only get one drawer of what the kind of climatology looks like over the next 20 years. Um, and so, you know, there is, there is really good work in the private sector. A lot of this work to understand physical risk, the risk of extreme weather events has evolved in this industry called CAT modeling, catastrophe modeling, which is an input into the insurance sector. Um, and there's really good work done there. Um, but kind of conveying the quality of that work to buyers, um, particularly ones that are kind of maybe newer to the space, um, is, is, is difficult. And so the inability to signal uh, quality can generate a race to the bottom and market unraveling in this sector. So I thought I'd provide some, some takeaways for discussion. Um, you know, these moves to assess and disclose physical climate risk, I think, are important. Um, but they are, we should recognize that these demands are really pushing the boundaries of readily available scientific knowledge, which has really, really focused on informing mitigation targets and informing kind of global uh, emissions, uh, uh, um, the global climate negotiations. Um, I think, you know, really close integration with climate science is going to be, you know, highly productive in this space um, in developing and evaluating the regular requirements and the exercises on physical climate risk assessment uh, in, for any kind of financial applications. Um, and we actually do need a new scientific field here and something I'm really excited about kind of working in coming out of CEA um, that's going to com com combine climate modeling, catastrophe modeling that are really quite different fields and kind of integrating them into financial risk applications as, really, as well as really more generally uh, adaptation resilience needs. Um, and so it, it's also important, I do see a lot of kind of econ papers that sometimes unquestionably take, say, private sector uh, kind of climate a risk information as a kind of true state. Um, and I think it's important to bring a healthy dose of kind of skepticism to some of those um, and to, uh, you know, realize that like a lot of the, the science behind this is not subjected to rigorous peer review. Um, kind of scientifically, it's not clear that that like as, uh, reflects the true assessment of risk and that these have not been really subjected to kind of scientific eva uh, evaluation. Um, and I think the pub involvement in the public sector in setting standards for climate risk information and developing high quality public resources would, would be very high value. Um, and just to close, to kind of point this out for anyone thinking about new uh, kind of research avenues in this area, uh, just before the holidays, there was a, a public memo came out from um, CEA, OMB, and the Treasury, which was a kind of essentially research priorities needed um, to support the management of near-term macroeconomic and financial climate risks. Um, and that this, this kind of speaks to the perceived gaps uh, in the space in, in kind of what policy, between what policy needs and what is currently available on both the transition risk and the, and the physical risk side, um, including kind of some of the things that, that I just mentioned here. So I will leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> I think you're you're raising a really important issue, which is the the quality control of these data providers. And I think, given uh, the many uses of the data that we're gonna see in the future, including for ESG investing and other applications. It's going to be really important to have high quality data. And so I'm wondering whether uh, the situation may be very similar, as you said, to like, like, let's say weather forecasting, where you have the National Weather Service uh, providing a forecast and then uh, private forecasters who also contribute to forecasting. Uh, but of course, the, 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 quality, the check of the quality of the forecast is much more difficult in, in this space where you have only one uh, really long forecast while uh, you can do your own comparisons of, of weather forecast every day. Uh, and so that's, you immediately see the challenge here. Um, but I, I, I think that you're raising a really important point. Mm -hmm. sure.
mean, I, you know, speaking very much, for, you know, in my, from my own point of view, um, I see it, I, I do see it as a kind of forcing function, and I think, I, and I think it is playing an important role. The reason we're up here kind of having some of these discussions is because there's been this kind of regulatory pull um, in this direction. You know, to the extent it, that then forces changes in, you know, the focus of, you know, elements of climate science, how that, in, you know, the, the types of information that is available, um, I think that, you know, it, you, you, you need kind of both of these moving in the same direction. You need the supply and the demand. And I think, you know, we, we're getting the, the demand signals here and, like, you know, hopefully the, the supply, supply will, will catch up with that. Um, so that's kind of how I see it. Depending on the literature, depending on the study, you, uh, people at the time documented essentially up to 20, 30 basis points. But it's not a major difference between uh, first the high exposure and first the uh, zero exposure. So, but what I think to, uh, you guys have been talking about is something about the future. So I would like to understand a bit from you how you uh, incorporate the, all those different futures into So yeah, I mean, I can answer that. So you have to be a little careful about these, these estimates. So if you look at, since I kind of run some of these regressions, I can kind of comment. The, so if you look at bond yields of like a typical, uh, so you have to start, what's your sample? So you cannot make such a general statement, right? So you have to say like, what is your sample? So if you, if you take a sample as you're a typical country like the Philippines and your capital there, right? Like let's say you're a capital owner and you're like, let's say there's, you know, the Philippine factories or whatever, right? And if you look at their cost of debt to rebuild, to, to adapt, it's very high, right? I mean, think about Puerto Rico. I mean, Puerto Rico still hasn't recovered after a disaster. And now, how does this connect to the future, of course, is that every strike is a signal about the likelihood of future strikes, right? You know, so like, if, you, if you're gonna get, you know, just, you know, if you go to these, these, these kind of countries, they, they'll tell you about this exactly. These now, of course, if you live in the US, then of course you have to ask, well, sure, if you're gonna talk about very deep publicly traded companies and you're talking about their yield spreads, well, sure, because they're pretty diversified currently. Right, so you know, even if you're gonna get a heat wave, it's not like that big of a deal, but that's a very small sliver of the, of the public market, right? Now, of course, if you're talking about capital as in like homeowners in Florida, they would tell you it's actually pretty expensive now, probably, to, to, to so, so you have to be specific about which segment of the capital market that you're talking about when you're trying to measure these, 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 these yield spreads. And you know, I think the risk metrics, whether you use like, you know, now, first comment. Second comment is about the banks, right, about, do I think these, these, these climate stress tests make sense for banks? My general view is no, right? Because it's basically like this, this notion of a stress test made a lot of sense during the financial crisis, of course, because banks were doing like weird stuff. And so you want banks to like divert. Here, I don't think banks are doing anything. I think they're just, I, think, I don't think banks know anything about climate risk. I think they're only beginning. And so I think that's the forcing thing is, you know, maybe it's a way of telling them, maybe you should think about it, right? But then of course, all of you guys always want to like, like fill out the report, right? You know what I mean? So you know you could write a more thoughtful report, right? You could just say, I haven't thought about it. Maybe I should think about it. And you could hire some academics and pay them a very nice salary to help you <laughs> write your report, which would be a nice thing to do. You should hire more 
sustainability analyst to help you write the report, rather than going to MSCI, getting their analyst to write the report for you on the cheap, which has made MSCI an extremely valuable company, right? Um, you can tick your pick, you know, I don't, I don't have a great, right? So, but, but, I, but for sure, I don't think like this notion of a, you know, gotcha, you know, you're like silver exposed, I, I, I don't think it's really, because everybody knows what the exposures are of banks typically to, I mean, maybe I guess, and I think this is exactly the point, you know, like our, our most recent banking crisis is like a bunch of community banks, you know, exposed to, you know, Silicon Valley Bank exposed to like VC industry basically, right, as far as I can tell, like nothing having to do with climate, you know, I guess there's a little bit of a crypto element, but, but you know, that's also pretty minor as well. I think what's, what's tricky too about the, some of these like stability assessments is this idea that like portfolios are gonna change in response to, you know, and so are we really talking about the risk to financial firms or are we really talking about the underlying risk and this like financial question is a question of who is gonna bear that risk. This comes up in, the, you're really seeing some of this play out in the insurance industry, I think, right now. Um, you know, and in, you know, if insurers kind of you know, think the risk is getting too big, you know, they're gonna pull out. The risk is still there. It's just being borne by different people, either the kind of homeowners or t often the, the state government or, or the federal government. And so you know, I think this is an interrogation into what these climate risks are, and then I think this question of how they interact with the financial sector um, is still kind of a question mark. <laughs> And maybe I can add one thing to the notion of risks, because I mean maybe that's a bit of a semantic point, but risk kind of implies that we know basically the set of potential events that can occur, and we can formalize a probability distribution over these. But over some aspects of climate change, actually, it's very difficult to do that. So then we speak more about uncertainty, and that's way more difficult to incorporate in our modeling framework. So that's something uh, we definitely have to, to think about. Thanks. Well, I'll, I'll jump in. It's an honor and it's humbling to be up here with Diego, Fran, and Harrison, and I thank Monica for this opportunity. Uh, for the last decade or so, I've been studying the, the asset management industry together with co-authors Lubus Pastor and Rob Stamball. Around five years ago, we shifted our focus to sustainable investing, sometimes called ESG investing. I'm guessing many people in this room today made a similar shift around a, a similar point in time. Uh, and I think it's great to see the profession focusing more on climate change, more on sustainability generally. Just in this AFA, this year's AFA program, I counted five sessions on, on, on related topics. I think this is great. So uh, what I want to do briefly is, is share some recent findings of mine on ESG investing, and then I'll connect these findings to the bigger picture, including climate change. If you work in this literature on ESG investing, you've probably read dozens of papers that begin with a sentence like this. Investing based on ESG criteria has exploded in popularity, reaching $35 trillion in global assets under management. Seeing very big numbers like this, $35 trillion, gives us hope that ESG investing can help us solve very big problems, including climate change. But are numbers like these accurate? Uh, how well do they reflect the amount of ESG-related investing that's actually happening out there? So those are the questions that, that we explore in a new paper of ours called Green Tilts. And what we find is that numbers like these vastly overstate the amount of ESG investing that's actually happening. So, so where do numbers like these come from? Well, the typical approach is to sum up the assets under management of industries that endorse ESG one way or another. And a popular way of doing it is by looking at the UNPRI. That's the United Nations Principles of Responsible Investing. Here's what you get. What I'm plotting here is the combined assets of institutions that have signed the UNPRI expressed as a fraction of the entire investment industry's assets. You get numbers that are huge. We see that almost 80% 80, 80 of assets are responsible and the numbers are, are going up. There are two problems, though, with this approach. The first problem is the problem of greenwashing. Right? An institution might sign the UNPRI, uh, 
but not actually shift its portfolio much in a green direction, so you'll get numbers that are too big. But there's a second problem that works in the opposite direction. There might be, let's call it a hedge fund out there that could care less about being responsible, has not signed the UNPRI, yet nevertheless has a big green tilt in its portfolio. It might be tilting green to hedge, let's say, climate-related risks, or it's, it's tilting green just because it thinks green assets are underpriced. And you would totally miss that with this approach. So we're going to take a different approach to, to uh, measuring how much ESG-related investing is out there. What we do is measure ESG-related portfolio tilts. So first, we go out and we get data on institutions' U.S. stock portfolio weights. So we get data on, on the portfolios of roughly 3,000 institutions, including big asset managers like Vanguard, but also pension funds, endowments, hedge funds, banks, insurance companies, and so on. We also get data on stocks' ESG characteristics, and other characteristics. And then for every institution in every quarter, we measure its ESG-related portfolio tilt. What's that mean? It's the portion of the portfolio weights that are explained by stocks' ESG characteristics. And in measuring that tilt, we're careful. We want to control for stocks' other characteristics. So we get these tilts for every institution, and then we aggregate them up to the level of the investment industry to measure the industry's ESG-related tilt. And, and here is our answer to the question, how much ESG-related investing is there? Our answer is the black, the solid line. We find that ESG-related tilts hover around 6% of AUM in the industry. That's more than an order of magnitude smaller than the numbers that are popularly reported. So really, the punchline of this new research is that the amounts of ESG investing out there are much smaller than the numbers that are popularly reported. The other thing that kind of jumps out is that it's not trending up. Right? The number of AFA papers on ESG investing is trending up, but the actual amounts of ESG portfolio tilts, they're not trending up. They do trend up, though, if you divide those portfolio tilts by active share. Active share is a measure of all of an institution's portfolio tilts, not just ESG-related tilts, but other tilts away from holding the market portfolio. So here I'm plotting ESG tilts scaled by all tilts, and it does trend up, especially since 2016. Where we, where we land at kind of the end of our sample is around 25%. What that means is, in recent years, almost one quarter of institutions' tilts away from the market portfolio are ESG-related tilts. So one quarter, that is not a, that's not a small number. Um, so these are, are, are the main findings. What's the big picture here? Well, I, I think the big question that's lurking in the background is, is to what extent can sustainable investing help the climate transition? I think this is one of the most important questions in this literature. A lot of people in the room and on this panel have been working on this question. I don't know the answer to this question. There's very lively debate right now. We'll know a lot more in five or 10 years. Um, this new paper of ours, Green Tilts, it does kind of add one piece to the puzzle. If ESG-related tilts are only 6% of the industry, it certainly raises concern that ESG investing is going to move the needle significantly on problems like, like climate change. So that's the, the bad news. Is there any good news? Um, I do think there is good news. Uh, I do think that sustainable investor, investors or ESG investors can help with climate change, even if their portfolio tilts are small. In fact, even if there are no ESG portfolio tilts, I think sustainable investors can move the needle. Let me explain. Here's a really simple example. Suppose everybody in the world cares a lot about climate change. And also suppose everyone is identical. So everyone cares a lot, but they're identical. Well, what's going to happen in that world? Everyone is going to hold exactly the same portfolio, because everyone's identical, right? What's that portfolio going to be? 
It's got to be the market portfolio, right? So in that world, there will be no ESG-related tilts. Everyone's holding the market portfolio. Um, there's no ESG investing in that world, only indexing. Yet, in that world, things change. Market prices adjust, so weights in the market portfolio adjust. Green stock prices would be high. Brown stock prices would be low. The market portfolio would be quite green because of people's concern about climate change. Another way to put it is cost of capital would be low for green companies. Uh, cost of capital would be high for brown companies. Um, and this is great news for climate change. Yeah? Even in that world, with no ESG investing, investors are moving the needle on climate change. They're helping in two ways. First of all, they're creating an incentive for every company to become greener. Because by becoming greener, you can lower your cost of capital and raise your stock price. And the second way it helps is by reallocating capital. It will induce green companies to scale up their operations. It will induce brown companies to scale down. Uh, so this is kind of, these are the channels we, we lay out in, in a paper of ours called uh, Sustainable Investing in Equilibrium. But it's all theory. Uh, one thing that remains to be seen are how big are their magnitudes? Um, to what extent can we really move the needle? For example, is there any evidence that capital has been reallocated from brown to green companies? And um, the answer there is yes, there is. So this is a chart also from this new Green Tilts paper of ours, where we're trying to measure um, the, mar the stock market's reallocation toward green stocks. We're studying the US stock market and we're measuring how much value is being reallocated from brown to green, com green companies. Um, the dashed green line here shows the E part, the environment part of ESG, and I'm plotting the cumulative amount of capital reallocated. So the line is going up. That means capital is being reallocated toward, toward green companies. So green companies are making up more, uh, a larger part of the market portfolio. So there has been a greening of the market portfolio. Of course, what's, un what's unclear is how much of that greening has resulted directly from ESG investors. Um, so to, to wrap up, let me go back to the, the big picture question, or the big question, to what extent can sustainable investing help with the climate transition? I'll finish with some speculation. My answer, I'll speculate, is not nearly enough. All right? ESG investing by itself is not gonna solve the climate change problem. We need much, much more than ESG investing. We need smart, strong government regulations. We need carbon pricing, preferably in the form of a carbon tax or, 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 or a cap and trade scheme. I do worry that ESG investing becomes a distraction. I do worry that policymakers use ESG investing as an excuse for inaction on policy. I worry they say things like, we don't need strong policies because the ESG investors will you know, solve climate change uh, for us. I personally do hope we, we get smart and strong climate policies on climate, or else I'm afraid we're going to see a lot more uh, uh, of this out there. Thank you. Thanks a, thank, thanks a lot, Luke. This was great. Um, the, one question that I have just listening to you is whether this is a problem of information that investors uh, may not have. So is, it, is the demand there for green investing and they're thinking that they're doing the right thing because you just using your first measure, it looks like uh, those investments are going up in green, you know, that there's the, a, green, a strong green tilt and is growing. Uh, or do you think this is really, your measure is reflecting prefer the demand for green investing? So I'm, I'm wondering uh, what it is. So, so why are these tilts only 6% and, and not particularly growing over time? I think it gets to, to questions about why people do ESG investing in the first place. And that's something we're just kind of beginning to understand. Tomorrow I'm discussing a really nice uh, paper by Stefano uh, Giglio, uh, Johannes Strobel, and co-authors, where they measure why people do ESG investing. Um, they measure this using a really big survey of Vanguard clients, and, and, and what they find is that roughly half of people see no reason to do ESG investing. 
Um, and uh, around 20% or 24% of people uh, do ESG investing in order to hedge risks, to hedge climate-related risks. Another 20% of people do ESG investing because they think it's the right thing to do, and 6% of people do it uh, because they think it's going to deliver high returns. I think it points a little bit toward the reason of why, why there is the amount that we're seeing. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. So, so I'll, I'll make a couple of I'll give you my two cents on, I think Luke's findings were really interesting that that's a public market sample, right? Okay. So I think, I'll make kind of three comments. So, so first, I was just in Australia and I was talking to, uh, so the way I think about ESG is that Australian funds, for instance, are, are super into ESG. Despite, I think, of course, as Luca and Diego pointed out, you know, they have, they're kind of as bad on carbon pricing as we are, right? Um, but the reason, of course, is that their governments have made a pledge, and a lot of their pension plans, you know, their government has signed up, they feel pressure to do stuff. So I was talking to some of their ESG managers and asking, you know, what, what, what they were doing. So the most aggressive uh, funds, I think kind of to Luke's point, you know, they're not really tilting aggressively in public markets, right? Because they kind of understand there's not a lot of great solutions for them in public markets. Right? Think about it, right? You know, in other words, for you to kind of invest in a lot of great green companies, they have to be listed first in a public market. So what, the way they solve their, their, their carbon portfolio budget problem is they go into private markets. So they make a lot of play for, so whenever they can basically find some interesting opportunity right, uh, uh, like in private markets, they go for that. And apparently that counts against their, 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 their carbon budget. So the way I think about it is that I think all these pledges that governments have made, right, is really kind of the big impetus behind ESG at like a big fund level, right? Because a lot of their funds have, they feel some pressure to do stuff. And they go out and they try to find solutions. The solutions are definitely, I think, not 80%, you know, in the, in, the, in the public markets. A sliver of it is in the public markets. They try to then kind of get it in private markets. And the problem, though, is that even the private markets are not very developed right now. So, so I, the way I think about it is that, look, all of these pledges are great because, of course, is it going to be as frothy as we think it is? No. But it is basically a signal to lots of entrepreneurs to come up with some private solutions. So, so for instance, you know, um, Bob Litterman, who all, you all know, with uh, Kipos Capital, right? And I was talking to this Australian manager. Apparently, one of their big investments is in a new product that Kipos Capital has. And I'm like, really? The, the, a bunch of these hedge fund guys? So, so apparently, these, the Kipos Capital guys have come up with a way to have some investments that you know, essentially will satisfy all the carbon budgets by basically packaging together a bunch of voluntary uh, uh, carbon credits in markets around, and a lot of that involves that, you know, you have to measure like a bunch of carbon flux in the Amazon forest. You gotta get that patch of land. Like, you know, the biggest deals on Wall Street this year were for forests. So I'm, I'm actually pretty, so I, you know, I, I agree. Do I, would I stick my hand on like an 80% tilt or something? No, and I think their paper is completely right. In public markets, which is what everybody studies, it's very limited because th these companies are not in public markets. You have to go to these private markets. You have to go to the startups. You have to go to the venture capital. That's where kind of the exciting, that's where the exciting projects that are kind of happening right now are, not, not in like the Russell 2000, you know? I mean, there's, there's like, there's no, there's no solutions to the climate problem in the Russell 2000. Let me just real quick add one thing uh, with regards to private versus public, because clean technologies, they're pretty capital intensive, so to finance these, you need a larger down payment typically. And obviously for big listed firms, that's maybe not big of an issue, but for smaller firms, that can be a big problem. So, I mean, it's reassuring to hear that there is some things going on also in the private space. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah, I'm, I'm also happy to hear there are good things happening in the private markets because you hear about plenty of bad things happening in the private markets. Like Ron Duchin has this paper that probably some of us have seen that it, empirically it tells the following story when a polluting company faces an ESG scandal, what do they do? They take their dirtiest assets, these are public companies, they take their dirtiest assets, 
and sell them to private companies. Those private companies continue operating the dirty assets just as much as before, sometimes even more than before. Meanwhile, the, the, pre, the starting company celebrates its success at divesting their dirty assets, and you see their ESG scores go up as a result. So I do think a lot of the bad behaviors is moving into the private markets where there's less transparency. I see a hand in the back. That's very interesting. Thank you, Luke. It's a very informative presentation. And uh, I have two questions. So the first one is about like, is, do ESG investors they like to firm or they just uh, change firms? Like, for example, do they still like that their portfolio firms, like they only invest in their green firms, or they invest just Sure, I'll try to reiterate the questions. The first was, uh, if I may paraphrase, um, are these ESG investors simply selecting certain types of companies for their portfolios, or are they, are they in trying to influence the companies and changing their operations? Uh, we study only the first part about selection. Uh, 
But the second channel you're mentioning, which you might call uh, engagement, shareholder engagement, is of course another way that ESG investors can have positive impacts, and it's great to see many people studying that. We don't. Um, the second question, oh, I always forget two-part questions. Can you write? Oh, does it, do, do companies increase their profits after receiving ESG money? Yeah. Or, um, uh, I have not done research on that. I'm sure somebody has. That's not me. Um, a related question, though, is when an ESG investor invests in a company, does it really incentivize a company to become greener? Uh, that's what should happen, according to my theory paper. Uh, Sam Hartsmark, I thought I saw him here earlier, Sam Hartsmark has a paper with Kelly Hsu arguing that, unfortunately, exactly the opposite seems to happen. Um, so he, he studies the following story. What if you're an oil company and your investors divest from you, causing your cost of capital to go up? Unfortunately, what seems to happen when the company sees its cost of capital go up, it just starts pumping the oil faster and faster because a higher cost of capital means you want to move your cash flows sooner in time. So they just start pumping the oil faster. Uh, so it's, it's possible that, that ESG investing can have these negative unintended consequences. I think in, in terms of a simple micro model where you have a production function that, that's operating with capital and energy, if you make the capital more expensive uh, because you develop an aversion to investing in brown companies, what these companies will do is substitute and the substitution is gonna be towards uh, energy, a use of energy instead of capital if, as long as the, the as long as there's a little bit of substitution between these two inputs, there's going to be a substitution towards energy. And so they will be, I think the, I, when I uh, look at the paper by Kelly Shu and, and Sam Hatzman, I, I think that the finding is a simple micro 101 uh, substitution story is that when you make capital more expensive, you substitute towards more energy and, and then you become dirtier in the short run. In the long run, you just die out. And so part of the ESG movement, I think, is uh, to shrink certain sectors or, or, or f certain firms within sectors. And uh, that shrinking is going to be very effective, uh, in the, but in the longer run, um, because if you're just, uh, you have a high cost of capital, you're going to die out in, eventually. Um, any further reaction? I do think this is a really, <clears throat> excuse me. This is a really interesting conversation. Um, I think the, it does highlight the challenges, I think, of, um, I, I think you're right about the goals of the ESG G movement here. And, you know, if we are a society that ultimately, like right now, relies a lot on fossil fuels, you know, there is a limited scope for kind of investment to change that because of the, the access to, to kind of substitute, um, um, uh, substitute capital. I, you know, and I think, you know, identifying these green, so, so if the goal is really to shift away from dependence on fossil fuels, it becomes kind of tricky to think about what is a green and what is a not green company. Um, electric vehicles are really interesting, right? They are a key part of our, you know, our strategy to decarbonize, right? We're going to shift into EV, then we're going to decarbonize the grid. But right now, if you shift into an EV, depending where you are in the country, um, you know, that may have... Uh, a, a large impact on your, the greenhouse gas emissions. It may, in fact, if you're in a coal-heavy grid, um, make greenhouse gas emissions go up. Um, and yet, that's a kind of important part of our strategy. And so, this is a complex question. Um, it's multidimensional. Um, I think maybe some of the indicators right now are like not fully capturing some of this. I also wanted to just um, because carbon offsets came up as well, and I. <clears throat> I do think there's a lot of risk uh, embedded in carbon offsets right now. Uh, I think a lot of companies are committing to kind of certain, you know, net zero or sustainability goals. They are relying on access to fairly cheap um, and frankly pretty incredible uh, carbon offsets. And I think you're going to start to see that. I think, you know, if we, if we do get more serious about climate goals, like those are going to go away. Um, like these things are not as cheap as the markets are making them seem to do this re really well. And there's a lot of um, kind of exposes and reporting on 
Um, just uh, like really good, like the lack of soundness in in the offset market. That's also true of some of the renewable en energy credits that a lot of companies are using as well. Um, and so that's certainly bears watching. Yeah, I was going to comment on uh, sort of the broader thing. You know, like when I was when I did ESG stuff, this was like 2008, and I remember uh, I was invited to 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 um, to, to Denmark. Sweden, one of these countries, to talk about my findings. And at that point, you know, I was labeled like this, this sort of bad guy, you know, because I was kind of writing this paper about how investing in sin stocks is like high returns, and everybody was like really shocked. And then, you know, after that that conference, I basically decided, you know, I'm not going to do ESG anymore because it's kind of weird, you know. And if you would have asked me, like sitting today, and you know, I think when I was doing that that stuff, I was in my 30s. If you're sitting today, it's sitting in my 50s. Right, and I'm like doing ESG. You know, you if you would ask me then, I'd just be like, no way, <laughs> right? And and I think the fact that there's so much interest is, I think, kind of a real success story. I mean, it's one, right? Because you know, you know, we live in a world where we don't live in a social planner world. We live in a world that's political, financial, reputational, and you know, you can't really get anything to change without using all three levers, really. Right? I mean. This just is not going to happen. To have a green energy transition, you really need all three levers. So, so I don't think there's like this notion of like, is it going to be the solution? I don't think is you need all three levers pulling, right? Because we don't live in this, 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 this first best planner world, right? We're like in third, fourth best. And, and I think that if you talk to, um, quote unquote, any of the activists, they will tell you reputational, financial, political. Right. You need all three to kind of get 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 some change, and and I think kind of in that sense, at least us in finance, we're doing our part. You know, we didn't, you know, we didn't just shirk and just free ride. I mean, at least we were doing something uh, uh, to that end. So, I do I do think speaking to this question of you know is ESG a, a kind of complement or a substitute to regulation? I I do see it more, and I think as as the question uh, the person that asked questions said, as as a kind of potentially a complement. I think really what it's doing it is articulating norms, and norms are kind of the precursor to kind of legislative change and and our legal change. And you know that I think is like you know my mental model is that that is likely pulling in the same direction, not in the opposite directions. Unless there are any, oh, there are more questions. Great. Um, oh, it's a question. 
Yeah, I mean, Ayako's question is, is very, I mean, I would kind of say her question is the following, that, you know, we talk about ESG investing in, in again, it's, it's too broad, right? Like in the sense that how you implement it really matters, right? So, so, so that, you know, of course, what a lot of things that's happening right now is that there's a very mechanical screening on some of these scores that may have some of these effects where, you know, these, these unintended effects, but you could, of course, redesign it in a very different way, right? Like, you know, there's, you know this is where academics and, and policymakers could come in and say, look, don't do it this MSCI kind of way, right? You could also basically have more, you know, I'll reward you with cost of capital if you actually, you know, follow through on the following sets of like abatement spending, right? You know, because right now, I think what's happening is there's a scoring, like, so basically what's happening, you know, there, there's a little scoring. Everybody's like a checkbox, like, you know, that gentleman right there, he just wants to check a box, mm -hmm. right? He wants to tell the Fed, you know, I think this is where the Fed is bad, you know, like, like look, no check, right? no, 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 brown, no brown stocks for me, at least on the, on the MSCI, we're not at the bottom. So everybody just goes check. And it's true, you know, like kind of everybody divests from the worst coal company. So for instance, there's a company I know um, called Vec Vectra. Like they're by far like the 10th outlier of all outliers in American companies in terms of like just pollution. Everybody dumps them. And of course, they're gonna go to a private market. Right, but the private market's not going to absorb, you know, like everyone. It's going to be pretty tough, right? So they're going to absorb kind of these, these kind of outlier guys, and then that kind of creates this, this thing of like, oh, it's really bad. Now, that's just bad because of the way the ESG is being currently implemented, right? You could do it another way. You don't have to do it that way. You can say, look, you know, I'm going to reward, you know, here's, I'm going to reward people who are going to basically make the following types of R&D spending or make the amount of like abatement spending, right? You could do it that way. But there's nothing that says we couldn't design it that way. We just are not currently doing it that way. And I think to some extent, that's kind of the fault of academics that we should, pro instead of just using MSCI data and like check, 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 we could just tell MSCI this sucks, basically. You know, I've, I've been on some calls with them and I tell them this sucks, but they never listen to me. But, you know, you could basically go, look, you know, you could kind of do it this other way. You could, and, and I think that a lot of it has to do with, this is where government policy is pretty important, is coordinating how exactly ESG is implemented. And I think in that sense, it's, it is a compliment, right, of how you exactly implement. You know, you could write models where you can have lots of good outcomes with ESG if you kind of write the right mechanism design setup, right? It's just that we're not, we're just kind of in a suboptimal uh, uh, checking of a box mechanism. Let, let me add to this that if you, if you look at the distribution of farms in the, in, in the world, I've, I've done this for the Europe area, uh, others have done it for the US and other countries, you see that the distribution of emissions in, in across different farms is extremely skewed. Uh, so the top 10% of farms that produce all the emissions, they, they're basically, um, those are, they're very few, they have very little, uh, they're, they're a very small share of the overall market, stock market, or you, no matter how you compute it, actually public, or there's also private estimates of firm values, so no matter how you do it, they're a very small share of the overall market. And so if you just divest, um, there's always going to be some other investors who are willing to, to hold because it's not that much value that they would have to hold in their portfolio so that this continues. Uh, what's much more effective is to tilt, what uh, Luke was talking about, tilting towards green is much more effective because now you're, you're subsidizing uh, projects that are actually moving us in the right direction. So I, I do think that the work by... Um, uh, Van Binsberg and, and Burke uh, on this topic and others uh, that may be in this room about divestment being having limited uh, effect, that that is true because it's just because you're divesting from very few companies and there's enough investors who don't care about ESG who will pick up those stocks. I think that's really interesting examples of some companies in particular that are kind of taking this approach of really thinking seriously about sustainability and what is in our kind of control to really change um, and then a th kind of theory of change about how that could then scale to have a bigger impact. And so some examples that come to mind, um, I think Google has really pushed the boundary on 24-7 um, renewable accounting and this has come up, this comes up a lot in emissions life cycle. So, you know, um, it's a little bit complicated, I'll have you talk about it more later, but 
Um, essentially, it's, you know, solar comes in during the day, so there's certain hours of the day when it's very cheap to get renewables, and there's other hours of the day where there's not. And right now, we basically don't do accounting at that level. Um, and Google has pushed, as part of its sustainability, kind of moving to this tracking system, um, and it's kind of really forcing the, the um, institutions that do that tracking of grid emissions to, to move in that direction. Another example, really interesting example is Stripe, uh, which did this kind of market commitment around really like long-term credible carbon removal. Um, the idea is that these, these are really, really new companies. This technology doesn't exist. If we can just kind of say what, we're gonna spend almost whatever it takes to get some tons of CO2, that this is gonna provide the impetus for really early stage companies. Some of them are gonna fail, but maybe some of them succeed. If some of them succeed and really scale, like that's a game changer. And I think like that's, you know, really interesting, I think, moving, taking it quite seriously about and, and thinking it, but it's not something you can kind of check a box, right? It, it takes a lot of, lot of work, I think. Maybe if I can add one thing. It's also related to a question that came up before on whether we should basically select greener companies or basically also change the actions or the behavior of companies. And if you look at, at green funds, I think... Uh, especially how they exercise their voting, uh, their voting rights. There is some research that shows that oftentimes they don't vote in a way that it in lines with like their ESG principles that they set out, and that's a problem. So we need to really work on the transparency in that realm. And one thing to, to end maybe, again, on, on policy maybe, because we have talked a lot about the failure of implementing carbon prices, but maybe one way to start would also be to get rid of negative carbon prices. Fossil fuel subsidies, in fact, they are at the record high after the Ukraine war. I think the number I saw recently is about 7 trillion. So if we would get rid of that, that would go a really long way. I just want to piggyback a little bit on what Fran was saying. Fran, Fran was starting to talk about an innovation and, and green innovation. I hope we'll get more into kind of where, where do we think are the promising areas for future research. There are many, but I think the most important area for research, in, in my opinion, is research on, on innovation and, and climate change. It, I'm increasingly convinced that green innovation is the only way we're going to get out of the climate crisis, so we need more research in that area. And my reason for thinking that is people and politicians have, have shown us pretty convincingly they are not willing to make major lifestyle changes to help the environment. Um, a case, simple case study is look at what happened in the year 2020 when the global economy largely shut down and we stopped traveling. Um, how much did emissions decrease in 2020? 4.6 percent globally. The Paris Agreement says we need to cut our emissions by 45 percent. So we need to do something that was 10 times stronger than what happened during COVID to, to hit um, um, climate targets. People are not going to be, they will not tolerate massive changes to their lifestyle, unfortunately. I think the only way we're going to reduce emissions to that extent is through major amounts of innovation. We need better clean energy. We need better battery technologies. We need better carbon removal technologies. I think we just really need they're going to the brightest minds working on green innovation. We know there's already a huge research literature on innovation. What's special or unique about climate-related innovation? I don't know. I, I hope some people here will, will start to, to think about that. They don't become more profitable, like they earn profits for their investors or they have better technology. They just, uh, like they have more money, so they become richer and they waste their money. And uh, so in that way, after more ESG investment, 
actually the environment should become worse. Can I understand it in that way? I, I was speaking more about what happens when an investor divests from a dirty company. Um, what happens when an ESG investor buys stock in a green company? Remember, it's not the case that the green company now has more money. If I buy stock in a green company, that means I bought that share from somebody. Right? It doesn't mean the company has more money. I think we're running out, uh, out of time. I would like to uh, thank, I, I think, a terrific panel uh, for their comments. I would also like to say that uh, since I was in charge of putting together the program for the AFA this year, uh, the number I saw the number of submissions in ESG, and it is huge. It was uh, some papers you can classify as plain ESG papers. Others are maybe sec have secondary implications for G ESG. If I, if I use a broad measure of ESG related research that was submitted to the AFA, it was roughly half of the submissions. Uh, and so this area of research is going to expand and I'm glad you're interested in it because we're gonna see a lot more of that in the future. And so if you're working on it, uh, I would like to apologize if you didn't make it on the program, if you submitted a paper and didn't make it on the program, uh, it was just the number of sessions. The AFA is a slow-moving machine, uh, and the number of sessions that can be devoted to this topic is very limited this year, but you'll see a lot more sessions in the future. Uh, and so keep working on it. It's a great area. Uh, we need to know a lot more things, as Luke was saying. Uh, there are so many things we don't know yet, uh, and so I'm looking forward to the audience's future work and the panelists' future work. So thanks a lot for being here. Thanks.